are recording. Who's starting? Uh, I Brian. guess I guess me. Okay. And I will go. Give me five seconds and make it happen, and I'll put you in full screen. Okay. okay. Five, four, three, two. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Need to Know, and you can stop sending us email now. We know we've been away for longer than we normally have, and uh, we're back. It's uh, 2023, and Ross and I are ready to rumble, and we've got some things to do today that sound pretty fun. We're going to be talking about that NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, that is passed and has some crazy teeth in it. We're going to be looking into that. We're going to discuss some of the letters that we've gotten from uh, some insiders who wish to remain anonymous. We'll talk about that. We'll answer some comments uh, made by our YouTube viewers, and we'll just generally get into trouble. But first, Ross, I want to welcome you. I know out in Sydney, you've been celebrating the holidays, but unlike me, who's going into winter, you're going into summer and you're mowing the lawn a lot, it sounds like. It's uh, it's all gardening at the moment, Bryce. I'm I'm enjoying, well, what's meant to be sunshine. It's actually pouring down with rain today, but we've had beautiful weather here until very recently. It's been absolutely divine. I had a gorgeous Christmas and New Year and uh, absolutely wonderful time with my family and friends. And now we're back with a vengeance for 2023. And I have to say, looking forward to 2023 being an insightful year on the UAP front, there's been a lot happening. As you know, the NDAA, that National Defence Authorisation Act, was passed just before the end of the year. And the implications of that legislation are pretty awesome. Uh, what about you? Well, you look a lot thinner, I have to say, mate. Is it just the I lens have, uh, at your end? Or? <laughs> it's these new new filters you can put on the cameras that are... No, actually, the truth is I've been trying to get rid of some of that pandemic weight. I did put on about 30 pounds in the pandemic and been sort wow. of struggling to get it all off, get back to my fighting on air weight and seem to have done that. You know, uh, speaking of the holidays, they were crazy for me. I spent lo I spent Christmas in Los Angeles. Then I my uh, football team, the Oregon Ducks, were playing in the Holiday Bowl, which they won 28 to 27 in a very exciting football game. And then I had to turn around and drive to San Francisco for New Year's. So a lot of driving around. One thing I will tell you is when I was growing up here in the United States and watched the local weather reports, nobody talked about atmospheric rivers. Nobody ever mentioned bomb cyclones. But that's what they're talking about here in Los Angeles. Last night, the rain was so intense, it woke me up about three in the morning. I looked outside into my backyard and, and it pretty much looked like a lake out there. Now, we have talked about many times on this uh, podcast over the last year about how the uh, Southern California area is in the middle of, of a drought, a historic drought. And none of this rain is going to make it go away uh, immediately, but it, it but it doesn't hurt. And one thing that was, was interesting, that drive between Los Angeles and San Francisco is normally kind of depressing because it's all dried up and everything looks like it could catch fire with a, a, you know, a careless match thrown out there and you could light the whole state on fire. This time when I drove between San Francisco and Los Angeles, it looked like Ireland out there. So that was at least a pleasant, pleasant way to start the new year. You know, it's actually very good news meteorologically that California is now getting lots of rain because that means, hopefully, that La Nina has broken. And that's been the cause of the very awful long wet weather systems that we've been having down here in Australia, where it's been nothing but flood. I, I spent part of summer pulling beautiful trees out of my garden that had died because they'd been basically denied of oxygen because of the amount of sure. water that's been in the soil. But, mate, you said something about a, a team called the Ducks. Is that a football <laughs> team called the Ducks? Okay. Did they now, win? And why are they called the Ducks? Okay. I Well, first of all, why is any why do they call it air? I, I don't know. Uh, somebody at one point. But the, the Oregon Ducks, uh, that's where I went to school, at the University of Oregon, same as our producer, Rich Johnson, who went to school at the University of Oregon. We even went to the same high school together, so we've got history. But anyway, the Ducks uh, had a really strong season. They faltered a little bit at the end, ended up not going all the way, but getting into what they call the Holiday Bowl, which is one of a dozen or more bowls that they have at the end of the year between some of these teams that are, you know, had never met before. We played North Carolina 
And um, like I said, you, in football, it's really hard to get a one point victory when you scored as many points as they did with the 28 to 27 win. It came down literally to the last seconds. It came down to where the clock was zero, zero, zero. And then the ref said, we're going to take another look at this play and came back and said, well, there is one second left on the clock, which gave the other team a chance to do a Hail Mary. Now, I know, I know in Australia, you guys call soccer football, if I'm not mistaken, right? Now, I forgive you for that, that, you know, that's your own thing. And I, but what do you call football then, which is what we think we play here? It's actually very confusing because we have rugby, rugby okay. union and rugby league. And we also have Australian football league, which is AFL. Wow. And we also have soccer, which is also known as the international game football. So frankly, um, we have far too much sport. And the, one of the great sayings in Australia is too much sport is barely enough. But um, yeah, well, I mean, I, know, I, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, no. What I was going to do was I was going to tell you about something else I'd done over the Christmas period, which was I've been teaching myself how to meditate. And I thought it's about time I tried CE5 because everybody's been talking about the the capacity to uh, uh, somehow attract the phenomenon by meditating. And, mate, uh, I, I did everything as instructed. Nothing happened. I've, 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 I literally sat in a grass field in the middle of the night, looked up at the sky. Uh, after a deep meditation, I invited the phenomenon to engage. I probably saw a few satellites, certainly certainly saw a few mosquitoes, but nothing engaged with me. This is, and my, uh, this is not a silent meditation retreat or anything like that. This is You went out to commune with other powers. I've, I've done I've done silent meditation retreats, mate. I once signed up for a four day meditation retreat, and I lasted one and a half days. I couldn't do it, and maybe that's my problem. I'm just not capable of maintaining the patience to be able to engage with whatever the phenomenon is because uh, I can't keep my mouth shut for um, for long. Well, you're a broadcaster. You're allowed. Listen, silent meditation. I mean, uh, I just had a friend yesterday who went off to a 10-day silent meditation. And right before he left, I debated whether to tell him your story or not, that you'd made it 24 hours and then fled. And I I elected not to. I want to give him a fighting chance at sticking around. My son has done week-long silent meditations multiple times. Uh, but I like to talk more than him. So I don't, I've never attempted it. I probably would make it like, I don't know that I would make it 24 hours, but maybe, maybe. I um, well, I, you know, I, I think it's I wanted to tell you though, you, go ahead. I think it's a good rejoinder to our YouTube critics who tell me that I talk too much, that I, it's proven right. Frankly, I can't keep my mouth shut. And uh, the idea of not talking for more than a day fills me with horror. Well, you, you know, already I've proved uh, my YouTube critics who are saying, why does he always interrupt Cold Heart? And it isn't that you're trying to interrupt each other, but, you know, we're in different countries and there's that delay and you think the other person might have uh, stopped. And so you're continuing on. It gets confusing. But what I was going to say is uh, a, a couple of things are going on here in the United States. We were talking about football. Uh, we've had a football player who had a, uh, uh, a heart injury on the uh, on the field and had to get uh, 10 minutes of uh, resuscitation and and life saving uh, events. And so the whole violence of American football is once again uh, being debated. So there. That that is happening, and um, you know the the uh, what was the other thing? I guess that's it. I guess I'm ready to move on and talk about this dang UAP thing. Although, although when we started doing this a year ago, UAP meant unidentified aerial phenomena, and now they've swapped it out again. UAP is still the new term they like, but it means unidentified anomalous. Phenomena. What do you think? Is that progress? Well, I think that's better because I think it's an implicit admission that what we're seeing and what's being recorded by military and civilian witnesses is not just aerial. It's not just in the sky. It's also under sea and it's also in orbit. And so I, I think the fact that they've changed it to anomalous is an acknowledgement that there is a phenomenon that that passes through all three mediums, water, air and orbit. So frankly, I think it's a good move. I, I do too. Um, 
because I think we've all been sort of saying, you know, there hasn't ever been a, a, a phrase that's been used that actually captures the whole thing. I mean, initially they were flying saucers that didn't quite make it. And frankly, before flying saucers, you had ghost rockets and Foo Fighters. Neither of those quite explained it. Uh, after a flying saucers, of course, they came up with UFOs, which was still flying objects. Then we got UAP. So I'm actually, you know, listen, I'll always have affection in my heart to call it UFO from time to time. Uh, but UAP does seem to be the broader, more responsible. And, and at the same time as we got UAP, we got Arrow. So in, we've evolved from Blue Book that uh, went out of business in 69 to all these other iterations of what they've tried to say. And I, I won't even go into them. The latest one, Arrow, stands for, what does it stand for? Anom all Domain Anomaly yes, all Resolution domain. Office. All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which I think is one of the deafiest, stupidest military acronyms I've heard in a long time. It's almost <laughs> like it's designed to not talk about the subject matter that it's, it's engaging with, UAPs. I always liked UAP Task Force, which was yes. a much better. I think that there was an original proposal in the draft legislation for there yes. to be the UAP JPO, Joint Project Office. And for some reason, that's been dropped and they've just stayed with Arrow. Maybe they'd printed the stationery and they didn't want to have to change it <laughs> I, have again. A, I, I share with you a fondness for the UAP task force. It seemed on point and kind of businesslike. Um, even going back to Blue Book, though, at least people could say what Blue Book was and you could pronounce Blue Book. We know that before Arrow, we had AIMSOG, which uh, completely ridiculous. Nobody wanted that. So Arrow... I'm going to go with Arrow. If that's what they want to call it, I'm I'm down with that. So we have the unidentified anomalous phenomena being inter, uh, uh, investigated by Arrow. Okay, we've got our definitions out of the way. Let's get on with it. Now, look, one thing I wanted to explain to our viewers and listeners before we go any further is why we hadn't done more of a show in December. And I, I think a lot of it's behind the philosophy of what we do with Need to Know. Frankly, I'll be honest, both Bryce and I were waiting for the release of the UAP right. report that was due right. at the um, uh, end of October. And I, to my incredulity, it's now 2023. We're, what, uh, two months on from when that report was meant to be released. And there is uh, a deafening silence from the <sighs> Congress and from the, uh, the Pentagon as to just why that report hasn't been released. And, uh, you know, I, I find it breathtaking. In my country, if a, if a committee was obliged by law to reveal information in a public report by a specific date, and if it had failed to do so, it would be a news item. It would be a big event yeah. that there's been a failure to heed legislation. But for some reason, I, I suspect because your Congress is completely tying itself up in knots at the moment, you don't even have a speaker. Nothing seems to be being worried about. And, uh, you know, when you've got Mr. McCarthy not sure whether or not he's going to be allowed to become the speaker, it also means, and um, our friend George Knapp pointed this out to us this morning, it also means that because uh, the new uh, or the returning senators and uh, congressmen uh, have not yet been formally uh, accepted into the new term of the Congress, apparently it also means they don't have the classification rights, the, the rights of access to the various committees of which they are a member. So they don't have the security clearances. And so um, people like Representative Gallagher, Mike Gallagher, who's one of the people who's championed the um, NDAA laws, he's not allowed to sit in in the various committees to, of which he has oversight roles, in, including, one would expect, the uh, various committees and subcommittees that have control over the UAP issue. So frankly, until this speaker impasse is resolved, it's kind of pointless having this new legislation because nothing's going to get done until somehow the Congress figures out whether it wants um, McCarthy or, uh, dare I suggest, Donald Trump from the MAGA side of things as the new Speaker of the House of Congress. Well, let's just remember, you know, that, um, the you know, nobody gets 
sworn in until there is a speaker. So they do have to wait on that. But you know what? I mean, here we are. Uh, it's a four alarm fire on day three. Uh, I don't know that I'm that worried about it. I, it may be embarrassing uh, for Republicans to see it happen. But you know what? This is politics. Uh, politics is going to work it out. Um, I think the bigger issue, of course, is that some of the people who I wish were being briefed on uh, this UAP classified information were actually getting the briefings. But uh, I, I guess I'm going to reserve judgment and hope that that happens sooner than later. There was one other reason, though, why, folks, we also only managed to output one need to know in December. And it's because we were invited by uh, Coast to Coast uh, with George Knapp. Uh, to to be his guests on one of his Sunday shows on December 17th. And we thought that was just too good of an opportunity to ignore because September 17th, uh, December 17th, rather, was the five-year anniversary of the New York Times reporting. And uh, it just seemed like an appropriate time. And we got to talk with George Knapp about what 2022 had brought and what 2023 may have in store for us. And we for those of you who don't have access to Coast to Coast, we're sorry that you missed that. But we um, uh, sometimes this thing can get a little um, overwhelming, uh, just trying to you know make, meet the demands. I don't know about you, Ross. Uh, to be honest with you, once a week uh, would put me in an early grave. I think uh, once, uh, you know, maybe twice a month is is about our speed. And to be honest with you, if you said, Bryce, damn it, let's just do it once a month. And you were powerful about it. I'd probably go along with you. <laughs> well, look, the other thing too is, I mean, I, I think we can be reasonably upfront about this, is that both of us aspire to make what we're doing as a TV yeah. series. Yeah. And so yes. we, we have been in negotiations and discussions with various parties about getting the money to do better budgeted investigations on the road. Uh, as you know, uh, Bryce and I have done stories together with the support of Channel 7 Australia's 7 Network, which I work with. And uh, we've made a documentary back in July, August, where we travelled around the United States and did some reports from there. And we'd like to do more of that as a TV series. And uh, that's the other thing that's been distracting us, is we've been working up a pitch deck for that to try and persuade people with money that um, the show is worthy of a, a broader audience, but more importantly, of more resources. It's kind of a dream of mine to get into the field, to properly research some of these events and claims that are being made. I mean, I'll give you one example, Bryce. Just this morning, I tweeted about a sighting in Russia where the Russians have reported, the Russian military have acknowledged to Newsweek magazine, a reputable news magazine, that a, quote, UFO, a ball of some kind, was seen hovering in the sky over the city of Rostov and that it was brought down by Russian fire uh, so, yeah. you know, no explanation, no, no, no explanation given. I mean, obviously, I think it's seen in the context of the Ukraine events, and maybe it'll turn out to just be a drone. But uh, it was fascinating that it was being reported in the Russian press as a UFO, and that <laughs> a, a magazine as reputable as Newsweek picked up on the UO, UFO acronym and ran with it. And my first frankly, take, oh, my first take when I heard that something was shot down over Russia was it was probably Ukraine that shot it down and not Russia. Uh, <laughs> it really is. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we all have to take it with a grain of salt because frankly, at the moment, the Russians are shooting at anything that moves over their sky. And uh, I think the last thing that they would want to admit is that it was anything Ukrainian. So uh, maybe they've used the term maybe. UFO to muddy the waters a bit. Or they're trying to get in the crash wreckage game uh, fast. I just want to go back for one moment to what you were saying. Yes, it is true, folks. We we would we have uh, aspirations for this show to to make it bigger, better, and you know uh, even more watchable and all that. I remember um, when I ran for the uh, chairmanship of the Television Academy, I wanted to get a bigger license fee for the Academy. And the reason I said we wanted a bigger license fee wasn't that I wanted to make the Academy rich. But I wanted the Academy to be able to what we call then dream bigger dreams. And that sums up what Ross and I are all about here. We would like to find uh, someone uh, who can help sponsor and fund uh, the need to know uh, show that we have and expand it into a television format. So there'd be a, a larger amount of funds available to do uh, travel, uh, to 
go after original interviews and stories and, and frankly, to shoot some of these stories and get them edited into you, uh, much as we were able to do with the uh, when Channel 7 helped us out. So we're still looking actively for that uh, while trying to keep this on the air. But but it is true that we're we're looking for it. And then, frankly, Russ, I just got to ask you something. Do you ever suffer burnout, UFO burnout? I do. And in fact, just before Christmas, I think I have to admit that was the other thing I was feeling. I was so despondent about the failure by the Congress to push for the release of the October 31st new report on UAPs. And I'm also slightly depressed as well by the bitterness and nastiness that's uh, that's emanating on social media around the UAP issue. It's yeah. quite extraordinary at the moment The the whole area of interest is consuming itself in a in a kind of a frenzy of backbiting and stabbing and backstabbing and um, there's a lot of people who I won't name names but there's a lot of people who've done a double backflip with pipe and who previously have been avowed ufologists who've come out and are now sort of trying to grab numbers in their viewership or listenership by basically um, spouting debunker themes in their in, in their philosophy but they're none too clever about it and and a lot of it is just personal attack and the thing that I I, I feel very very strongly is that we're involved in an objective analysis here of a mystery nobody's saying yeah. it's little green men nobody's saying it's aliens um, indeed some people are hinting that it might be aliens but uh, the interesting thing is that um, what we're doing is we're openly acknowledging that there is a phenomena that is a mystery that we're engaging with as humanity. And the military, the American government and other governments around the world are being more open about that. And here we are, and we're about to talk, of course, about the national defense authorization laws relating to unidentified anomalous phenomena, no longer aerial phenomena. It's a momentous time. And yet at this very moment, Twitter, social media and Facebook, it's sort of tearing itself apart with sniping and infighting between different UFO groups. And I'm trying to keep out of it. I'm keeping my head down. But there's a, there's, there's a lot of nastiness out there. And I well, think it's essentially a, fr a frustration that people are feeling that there's not a lot happening very quickly. But if I can leave you with this thought, Bryce, I, yeah. I think that the momentous NDAA laws, the reason I think we should be giving them some emphasis is because I've been rewriting one of the things I've been doing during the period of the holiday break over Christmas, New Year is I've been rewriting um, some of the chapters in the back end of my book In Plain Sight because we're doing a new edition of the book right. for the June, July summer period in the United States. And that process of just going through what's happened in the last 21 to 24 months since I finished my manuscript is quite extraordinary. There has been so much that has happened in the news uh, that really I think has been overlooked because the pace has been so intense. And so I, I think one of the things we need to do is, yes, acknowledge the NDAA, but respond to the infighting and spiteful nastiness that's occurring on UAP Twitter and other social media to the simple fact that there's a lot happening. There's, there's been a an enormous happening. amount that's been very, very positive. Yeah, there is uh, a lot happening. I Look, I'm not surprised that people uh, fight on UFO Twitter or Twitter in general. That that, that does happen, um, and but it doesn't shock me anymore. And I try to I try to not have too much of it aimed in my direction. Listen, congratulations on In Plain Sight being uh, uh, put out as an American edition this year. It's about damn time. I've uh, tried to share your book and have with uh, a number of people, but it's always a, a challenge and it's going to be so much easier when it's here. And I, I look forward to seeing these new chapters you're writing because you've got so much to update since uh, the, the time the book actually came out. So congratulations on that. If we can, if I can just uh, do a quick uh, how I spent my Christmas vacation uh, on top of uh, you being locked in your uh, office uh, working on those other chapters. I think I've discussed with uh, with you and with other people, I've been working on a scripted podcast for uh, Jeff Sagansky, the executive um who I did uh, Dark Skies with. He was running Sony at the time. He ran CBS back in the day. Anyway, uh, Jeff knows a lot about this topic, and uh, he and I have always wanted to do uh, something on this on the topic. 
uh, since Dark Skies. And what we've come up with is uh, something called Undeniable. It's a 30 minute scripted podcast um, that I've just completed the pilot and the uh, Bible for it. And we're out in the market with it right now. But Undeniable, I, I, I don't think it'll spoil too many things, is 30 minutes from the future. It's a 30 minute newscast from the time when we all agree that we're not alone, where something has happened that clearly pushes us all over to the other side of the equation, where we're sure that um, uh, something is going on and it probably involves craft in our skies and seas here on earth. So that's been really fun. It involves a lot of prognostication about the future, but I'm no, uh, I'm not afraid of that because Richard Dolan and I did it when uh, we wrote our book AD after disclosure. So literally, um, in addition to fighting with the grass that you did, you also got some chapters done. And I got this thing done while also fighting with our rainstorms here. So all is good. And I think, you know what, um, as they said, about, I don't even want to quote, they used to say when Richard Nixon came back uh, in his comeback, he was tan, rested and ready. And I was about to say I was tan, rested and ready, but first I'm not tan and I don't know how rested I am, but I am ready. I'm ready. Let's do this. Should we talk NDA? <laughs> A. Let's talk. Let's talk NDAA. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 what's the best way to do this? Why don't I just read what I think is probably a minute of the most crucial subsection in this new legislation? So this is the subsection or so section one six seven three unidentified anomalous phenomena reporting procedures, subsection A, mechanism for authorized reporting, one establishment. The Secretary of Defense, acting through the head of the office and in consultation with the Director of National Intelligence, shall establish a secure mechanism for authorized reporting of a any event relating to unidentified anomalous phenomena and this is the kicker b any activity or program by a department or agency of the federal government or a contractor of such a department or agency relating to unidentified anomalous phenomena, including with respect to material retrieval, tick, material analysis, reverse engineering, research and development, detection and tracking, developmental or operational testing, and security protections and enforcement. Now, before I go any further, Bryce, I, I really think wow. that that is that, that that is just momentous legislation. I, I think it. Well, first of all, I mean, think about what it's doing. It's, prov I mean, at its core, the reason people are excited is it provides protection for potential whistleblowers. But what I think blows your mind and my mind, and I think people who are listening and have been involved in this topic for a while. You know, if you're going to start talking about reverse engineering and, and crashed craft, I suppose you might be talking about some Russian aircraft you picked up. But generally speaking, I think people who know are saying they're talking about the real deal here. And if, if we've come to this place where our Congress is preparing to offer whistleblowers protections to come forward to talk about alleged crash retrievals of craft that aren't from around here, then I think 2023 is teed up to be one of the biggest years ever. And the thing that also makes me quite positive is I know there's been a disturbing silence from the Congress, uh, from the various senators and Repub uh, representatives who've championed the earlier subsections and drafts of this legislation. But it's interesting to see that the people who've been pushing this legislation and who, who championed it through the Senate in particular are people like the um, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Chairman Mark Warner, who's the Democrat from, I think he's from Virginia, um, the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence uh, lead in the Republican side, Marco Rubio, who's Republican from Florida. And then you've got Mike Gallagher, Republican from um, Wisconsin, yep. and Ruben, yep. Ruben Gallagher, de Democrat from Arizona. So it's a multi-party, both sides of the House are championing legislation that is demanding that the Pentagon and the intelligence community and indeed private contractors own up to any reverse engineering program involving UAPs. I mean, wow, it, it really you know, is quite extraordinary legislation. 
One of the things um, that I did in working on this undeniable podcast in AD with Richard Dolan was we, in order to project to the future, we would sometimes look at the past. We'd say, well, you know, what are the analogs for the past? So as a great example would be uh, when we needed to in the past, we uh, shut down the stock market, right? So maybe after a disclosure, we'll shut down the stock market uh, to keep people from overreacting. Well, the analog for what's going on in UAP for me goes back to 1975 when uh, we formed the church committee, which was a Senate committee uh, that actually turned out to create the Senate Select uh, Committee on Intelligence that you're talking about right now. And that was one that was uh, created to look into CIA and intelligence abuses. And they turned up some stuff that nobody saw coming when they started, such as uh, Operation MK Ultra that involved drugging and torture of U.S. citizens. So I guess what I'm at least offering here is uh, whatever they know right now, if you start to investigate and your committee starts pulling in witnesses, whether it's public or uh, classified behind closed doors, either way, you start to build uh, on the case. And you say, well, if we knew this, then maybe we should talk to so-and-so about it. And so for my money right now, I think 2023 uh, might just uh, pull in some surprise witnesses from these whistleblowers uh, who might draw some credible observations. And some of them are likely to come forward and say, not only did I work on this reverse engineering, I can tell you who has the craft right now. Uh, because remember, even Senator Harry Reid uh, was public saying he thought Lockheed Martin had the uh, had some uh, craft that they were reverse engineering. So, I mean, the games have begun. They have. And it's very interesting because I, our friend George Knapp and um, Jeremy, Cor Jeremy Corbell, they've both said that they're aware of whistleblowers who are either have already given evidence or who are about to come forward, who allegedly know the location of retrieved craft. And I mean, the amazing thing is you've got people with the eminence of Chris Mellon, former yeah. uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, uh, State for Defence, Secretary of Defence. I mean, it's amazing to me that these people are talking quite openly about the possibility that these are non-human intelligence-derived technology. But, 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 and there's always a but in legislation. You've got to read the fine print, and that's what I've been doing. If you keep on reading the fine print, it's quite clear they're going to protect the special access programs. There's not an intention here for the full details, the full grubby details, as happened in the church committee. There's no intention here for another Project Mongoose to be exposed, you know, where they're revealing poison pens that tried to kill President Castro. Pro pro the, the second um, uh, clause or subsection is protection of systems, programs and activity. The Secretary shall ensure that the mechanism for authorised reporting established under paragraph one, which is what I just read, prevents the unauthorised public reporting or compromise of classified military and intelligence systems, programs and related activity, including all categories and levels of special access and compartmented access programs. So there's no intention that there will be a public disclosure of SAPs. I mean, they're quite rightly, and I can understand why, if they have developed technology from this, if there is reverse engineered technology, as wacky as that sounds, imagine if America is sitting on an anti-gravitic platform or some kind of energy system that is derived from free energy. Okay, it's appalling if it hasn't been disclosed properly to the Congress, but by golly, if they've got technology like that, You'd want to keep it secret. Well, You'd want to keep it in reserve. Okay. I'm an American who's been around for a long time, more years than I like to admit, and I've been paying taxes for a long time. And I'm, I just don't want to cut anybody a pass. Uh, it is time to at least acknowledge the basics. I think that needs to happen. And so I don't, you know, we can argue about classification, but to say, uh, we got to go through a few more years where we don't even admit to the basics uh, really offends me. I just wanted to throw one quote out uh, that came out of our friend Jeremy Corbell in this uh, same interview. He said, we are because I just thought this was such a concise way to say it. We are talking about official, likely illegal 
government programs that have been studying the UFO puzzle substantially, physically, and scientifically in secrecy. Okay, so for me, a start would be, let's just admit that. You know, you don't have to tell me the names of every program. You don't have to, uh, you know, um, uh, bring a piece of a crashed wreckage onto the Tonight Show so that Jimmy Fallon can play around with it. You don't have to do that, but you do have to at least get us in the game. And and I wonder, and I just want to, okay, I see you want us, but I got a question for you. Go ahead first. No, I, I look, and I know this is preaching to the converted, but the only point that I wanted to make to what you just said was, isn't it bloody ridiculous that we've got a situation where in black and white, in the congressional record, there is now a, a reference to yeah. um, back engineering programs, in, you know, which may or may not be back engineering alien technology. Uh, um, and there is, there is not a jot of interest from the mainstream media. What is I mean, I, I, don't, I do not, I, for the life of me, I do not understand why the New York Times or the that Washington Post. That was me having Post, my head explode. Okay, go ahead. I know, it's just insane. I mean, at what point does the editor of a major newspaper go, you know what, boys? We are going to be the ones to break this. We are going to put an yeah. investigative team onto trying to break this story. Because when you have in the congressional record, the Congress taking this issue seriously enough after decades of derision, right. referring to material retrieval, material analysis, reverse engineering, R&D, detection and tracking of UAPs, at what but, point does the the editorial management of major news media go? Wow, this is something say, important. And, and, and I just want to point out one thing. Important. Yeah, I just want to point out one thing. It isn't just in the congressional record, where of course it is in the congressional record. But what's astonishing is it's the law, the NDAA, yeah. the National Defense Authorization Act, was passed by the Senate. It was passed by the House of Representatives back when they were able to meet, and it was signed by the president. It is law. So those words that you're reading that we are talking about right now are the law. So I also share with you just an astonishment that a conventional, that should be all the trigger that a conventional news media organization should need. It's the law. It's shocking. Let's take a look at it. They're not doing it. And I had one, here's the question I had for you. Do you think some of the, the I, just essential craziness, zaniness of, of crash wreckage retrieval and all that stuff in there, is that why they're having a hard time with this report? Are they trying to square a circle that they don't know how to square right now? No, look, I, I mean, everybody I'm talking to is telling me that we're tying ourselves in a knot about this for no good reason, and that it's quite common in the Congress for reports like this to be delayed. And in fairness to, I think, Sean Kirkpatrick, the guy who's in charge of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, poor bugger having to write that into a document every day. Um, in fairness to him, I'm told that ARO is incredibly under-resourced and that they're still hiring staff. And that, frankly, they haven't got a, okay. um, you know, they, they haven't got sufficient staff to be able to bang a report like this together. Well, then let me let me let me invoke our college years, my friend. Okay, when you had a report due, and it was due on Friday, and you woke up on Tuesday and said, "Damn it, I didn't start that report. I better get to it." Did you go to the professor and say, "Yeah, I kind of had a kegger last." week and I haven't quite recovered. Can I have another couple of weeks on it? You didn't get to say that. You had to buckle down and write the report. So I'm saying, why do, does a college student have to work harder and meet a deadline better than our own government on a matter of such importance that it's in a newly passed law and has been something that it's clear the government has been investigating for eight decades? So I the days of Bryce giving people a pass, and I hate to speak of myself in the third person, so I apologize. No, no, I, I, think you're giving... absolutely right. I think we formally we formally make it that Ron Moultrie, who's the guy responsible right. from USDI for all of this, um, let's give Ron Moultrie an F. No matter what happens, yes. we're not going to give it a pass mark. The UAP report officially receives a fail.
it receives a fail. And by the way, on the topic, I agree with you very much. On the topic of Moultrie, as I understand it, in the reporting structure of this current NDAA, Moultrie uh, is not the accountable person for uh, reporting on this. It seems to me that it's Lloyd Austin, who's the Secretary of Defense, and it's um, Avril Haines, who is the Director of National Intelligence, which means Moultrie's been demoted a little bit. Well, yeah. Uh, in the past, all of the reporting had to go to Moultrie. And um, I know there's been a lot of controversy about Ron Moultrie, even though he's a very highly respected official. He does appear to have a very dogmatic and truculent view on the issue of UAPs. And so now, under this legislation, the reporting goes, I think, to the Deputy Secretary of Defence. I think her name is Kathleen Hicks. And she was notable because she's the woman who, last year, as a very senior official of the Department of Defence, made the very noteworthy order to all personnel that they were now under an obligation to report UAP incidents. And so she's noteworthy in the sense that she's signalled a change of attitude, a change of mood inside the Pentagon, a willingness to actually be seen to be investigating this phenomenon. And look, just so you know, Bryce, it's not all good news in the NDAA. The lawyer in me has been looking at some of these clauses. There's a a subsection called sharing of information, which requires, among other things, prompt sharing within the office. And it says that the Secretary of Defence shall ensure that the mechanism for authorised reporting provides for the sharing of an authorised disclosure to personnel and supporting analysts and scientists of the office that's the office that will be doing this investigation work into UAPs, regardless of the classification of information contained in the disclosure or any non-disclosure agreements, unless unless the employees or contractors administering the mechanism under paragraph three conclude that the preponderance of information available regarding the disclosure indicates that the observed object and associated events and activities likely relate to a special access program or compartmented access program that as of the date of the disclosure has been explicitly and clearly reported to the congressional defense committees or the congressional intelligence committees and is documented as meeting those criteria. So I just have one question. Could you put that in English? And I don't care if it's Australian English, just put it in something I can understand. There's an out there for, say there's a dastardly corporation or a dastardly section of the Defence Department. Let's say, oh, gee, the Air Force. Let's say the Air Force has got a secret group that's been hiding a retrieved flying saucer buried at the back of Edwards Air Force Base somewhere. So long as they can prove, or how does the wording go? So long as they conclude that the preponderance of information available indicates that it's been properly reported to the Congress. And I presume that means reported to the Gang of Eight, which is the the most super sensitive secrets in the US, only have to be reported under waived, unacknowledged special access programs to the Gang of Eight, which includes the Speaker, the House Majority Leader, the House Minority Leader, and and also in the Senate. So long as it's properly done that way, This legislation won't require it to be reported to the ARO. And that's a problem in my book, because I don't think we can trust these people to make the judgment on the preponderance of evidence that, oh, gee, I I reckon we've complied, Joe. What do you reckon? I mean, we (laughs) stuck it in an envelope and left it on the floor in the Senate Select Committee about two or three years ago. You know, I I reckon we've fulfilled. I reckon we've fulfilled all of our obligations. (laughs) <laughs> there, are, there are there are other obligations here that are quite good too though Bryce there's um there's a requirement that less than 70 not later than 72 hours after it's been determined that yeah. an authorized disclosure relates to a restricted access activity a special access program that has not been explicitly and clearly reported to the congressional defense committees or the congressional intelligence committees the secretary shall report such disclosure to such committees and the congressional leadership so what they take away with one hand they give balls with another so i'm, and, I'm but, not quite sure what to think you know about. here's part of the problem it, we're relying on that uh, to, to 72 hours to be a real 72 hours. 
um, it would be a lot easier to believe that they were going to follow the 72 hour rule. If they'd followed the every by October 31st rule, you're going to have a report out on UAP. So if they can miss one deadline, they can probably miss another. So that doesn't give me confidence. Um, something, though, that did strike me about uh, Jeremy Corbell's interview, and I know Jeremy's a controversial guy, but he he certainly has sources and he's he's got opinions about what he's being told. And one of the things he said in that interview, he uses the phrase direct knowledge. So presumably when somebody has direct knowledge, they've talked to somebody who they think is a pretty solid source. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, he has direct knowledge that the process that we're talking about has already started. And he says, multiple individuals have recently come forward on record about UFO exploitation programs and physical hardware. And he says he's also aware of specific UFO related holding locations. So if these things are sort of working their way into the system, the thing about those things is they don't tend to easily work their way out of the system. It's harder to get them into the system before Congress. Now, I know Congress looks pretty dysfunctional right now, but the House is always more dysfunctional than the Senate. And we've got some senators um, who don't look like they're prepared to, to grant a, a pass to anybody on this thing. So maybe, maybe this year. So there is a bit of a question mark about this legislation yeah. because one of the other things it does is it um, it actually doesn't carry the original mechanisms of oversight that were independent of the Defence Department. Uh, originally in the legislation, you were going to have the, um, I think, the General Accounting Office, which is a fantastic government department, independent from all the other government departments, overseeing the propriety of the mechanisms to make sure that the UAP laws were properly heeded. And unfortunately, in the drafts that have come through and finally come through for uh, approval in the Congress, there's now, it's kind of been put back to the um, the department, to the Defence Department, to come up with the mechanism that will be put in place. And they only have to report in six months' time now, uh, in the middle of this year, they have to report to the Congressional Defence Committees, the Congressional Intelligence Committees, a report detailing the mechanism for authorised reporting that has been established under the um, paragraph one that I read out earlier, which is the, the whopper paragraph that requires mm -hmm. reporting on all of these UAP phenomena. So frankly, if they're not reporting for six months into this year, the mechanism that they plan to put in place to actually control how this reporting is done, if the Congress hasn't stipulated that in this legislation, there's going to be another delay in getting that legislation uh mechanism stipulated before the Congress before it actually starts working properly. Now, I'm told it's too gloomy and pessimistic to say it like I read it here in the legislation. I'm told that in reality, already committees are hearing witnesses that what Jeremy is saying is right. I've heard yeah. from my own sources that they've been approached to give evidence and that there is already are, uh, requests being made to witnesses to come forward to give evidence. Um, that then brings into question the protections that are put in place to protect those witnesses, because you'll remember, originally there was going to be a civil right where um, witnesses were basically given uh, a protection, and that Correct. protection is in this legislation. There is a prohibition on reprisals, and it says that an employee of a department or an agency of the federal government or of a contractor, subcontractor, grantee, subgrantee, or personal services contractor of such a department of agent or agency who has authority to take or direct others to take, recommend, or approve any personnel action shall not with respect to such authority, take or fail to take or threaten to take or fail to take a personnel action, including the revocation or suspension of security clearances or termination or employment of employment re with respect to any individual as a reprisal for any, for any authorized disclosure under this legislation. So there's a protection put in place nominally to protect the whistleblowers. 
Um, but unfortunately, again, whereas in the draft legislation, they had the oversight of the GAO to make sure that it was going to be properly regulated, it's up to now the Defence Secretary and the D Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, to establish procedures. So the, the Congress has essentially buck passed the role of deciding what those procedures will be to basically the, the cat with the cream, the Pentagon. And I've got a problem with that. You know, it's not all good news, uh, but I do uh, love to hear you read bureaucratic language. There's just something about <laughs> hearing it with an Australian accent that somehow gets in here and out there better. Uh, listen, I've got uh, good news and bad news uh, for us. The uh, bad news is we're out of time. The good news is we have so much stuff we didn't get to that we start out with a leg ahead on the next one. So, folks, we'll probably be back in two weeks instead of uh, longer. And, uh, Ross, before we go, I just wanted to do uh, the one part that we talked about doing, which is the updates for people who write us on our YouTube page and say, what about, and uh, we each have a what about, and we should each do a quick mea culpa on it. Your what about is what's going on with the metal sphere investigation with Gary Nolan? That's what everybody wants to know. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, it's very interesting because everybody seems to think that they've got an absolute right to know everything right away. And right. you bloody well don't. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you when we're good and ready. Um, the bottom line is the, uh, the research will be done when Gary gets the lab access that he needs to do not only the materials analysis of the actual metal content of the ball, but also a, an ability to actually scan and inspect the inside of the object. And what's complicated the issue, and Gary's spoken about this publicly, you'll find this on my Twitter feed if you look, um, is that uh, we're now aware of as many as six or seven of these objects, um, that, that there are people willing for these things to be scientifically tested and investigated. So it's not a simple question of just one sphere. Uh, and also the other thing is the owner won't let us cut it open. So the obvious way of resolving what it is and how it operates, if it operates at all, is just to hack it open. But in order to uh, investigate it, to do the kind of materials analysis you were, you need, you need an extremely good laboratory. And we were hopeful that we'd be able to get a laboratory would do this, that would do this work within a matter of months, but we can't. And we're waiting on access to one that will give us the uh, the kind of information and materials analysis and scan capacity that we need. And if and when we get that, we will definitely report on it. Let me do a follow up then. If um of those six or seven other bets balls that uh, come to light, uh, one of those owners said, yeah, I don't give a damn. Cut the damn thing open. Uh, would you cut it open? Oh, damn right we would. But then okay. there's a question of whether or not the laboratory that, because there's a there's a legal liability sure. here because we don't know what's inside these things. Well, Let's I'm, assume I'm afraid that, that if I... you cut it open, you're going to blow up Stanford. That's what <laughs> I, know. Yeah. I know. Well, there is that issue. And I mean, frankly, you can't be frivolous about this because, no. um, you know, we, we don't, don't know, know what what's is. inside. It might have some kind of power source that is possibly radioactive. We don't know. So let's let's so, just say to our audience that, that it's being looked into. We haven't forgotten about it. You're on it. Gary Nolan's on it. You know, progress is moving ahead at its own rate. Yeah. And, and look, yep. to the tinfoil hat crazies who think that there's some kind of cover-up, crazy crazy cover-up going on, there ain't. It's um, follow the maxim that I've always followed as a journalist. Always assume a screw-up before a cover-up. Now, Ross, you're assuming all of us who like to wear a tinfoil hat are crazy. Now, some of us like to wear a tinfoil <laughs> hat because it's a style choice, right? And uh, uh... <laughs> no, mate, I've, I've, got to, I've got to throw one back at you on the updates. Yeah, okay. You'll, you'll remember in our documentary that we made with Channel 7 Australia, you told sure. the incredible story, uh, or in fact, your very, very good friend told an incredible story of the two Navy intelligence officers, and one of them drew a formula on a paper sure. and said, sound, light, and frequency, the secrets of the universe. Right. And what happened to that formula? Well, well, here's many people. I mean, most of most questions on that particular documentary seem to uh, come around this. First of all, Ross and I uh, did not do the final edit. The people who did were at Channel 7. And so they kind of didn't edit in a resolution to what happened with that note. 
the note itself is still missing. Okay. I laid eyes on it. Brent had it. Uh, Brent Friedman, my dark skies, uh, uh, co-creator. Uh, uh, Brad Markowitz, one of our staff people, had seen it. Uh, Brent's wife saw it. I mean, we all saw the guy write it and whatever. Nobody took the photograph? This is 1996, and we did oh, not have okay. cell phones in our pockets. Um, so no. It's, it's, and, the ubiquity of, it's the ubiquity of cell phones these days that makes us think there must have been a photograph. Absolutely. I mean, and I, I say that with, you know, I'm not happy that I don't have it. The reason uh, this thing escalated anyway, is I said to Brent last year, uh, damn it, man, you've had it for 25 years. I need to see it because I want to write about it. I want to show it to Ross. I want to show it to some other people. And Brent thought it had been in his, um, it, you know, that he had put it in a lockbox um, and it wasn't there. Now, we don't think anyone took that. We think that in his moving from uh, one behind the scenes in his moving, it got put in another box. He's looking for it. We hope to find it. I, I just though have been thinking a lot uh, about what it actually said. I don't think it's a legitimate scientific equation, at least in my head. I almost remember it as, um, you know, uh, SLFX for frequency or FQ for frequency equals um, so too, you know, secret of the universe. It was that kind of simplistic thing. So I don't know that it could be analyzed. I just know that this guy said it and we all saw it and we thought he was credible. And I, in the same way that you're going to follow it up, I'm still on it. I hope to find it someday. Brent and I are looking for it. When we find it, I will hold it up to that camera and show it to everybody. Because uh, I, I think no, no, we should emphasize nobody wants that bloody formula more than you and I. I can't I, I, I'm just dying. <laughs> Uh, and I feel sorry that I, you know, we didn't have it. I feel bad that we didn't put in our show why we didn't have it. Um, but now, now, you know, and it's time for us to move on. So listen, uh, we've, uh, we've, we're back on the boards. It's 2023. We're, we're making some noise again. And I, I hope that we continue to do it. It's been, um, I would have to say that 2022 was really an education for me because I had to bring my game up to sit here on camera with someone like yourself who has done so much incredible investigative recent work. And it's really helped me a lot. And I, I'm beginning to see this whole issue in ways that I never did before. So um, hopefully we'll be well, able I to talk I, a lot more about that this year. I, I think it's a fitting closer for us, Bryce, to make reference to the fact, because we've been getting one of the other queries I wanted to follow up with you was on your Dark Sky series, because a lot of people yeah. have heard about your Dark Sky series and they don't know where to watch it sure. and it, it did strike me um in in conjunction with mentioning your dark skies series which i think is one of the best um fictional explainers of the possible conspiracy that's gone on behind the right. scenes here i wanted to leave with asking you you know do you think that sometimes with fiction what you've been doing in hollywood through your work as a screenwriter and producer, do you think sometimes with fiction, it's an easier and better way to explore the possible or likely conspiracies that have gone on behind the UAP subject than it is to try and investigate it through proper, hmm. objective, non-fictional, rigorous scientific inquiry? That's a tough one because I've lived on both sides of the equation as a as a reporter myself and then as a creator of TV series. Look, my preference would be uh, the journalistic solution. I would rather uh, journalistic uh, knowledge come out, be debated about uh, where it came from and su uh, subjected to uh, investigation. Uh, on the other hand, um, I... I think that it is true during this cover-up that we've lived through for the last 80 years, uh, many truths have been floated as fiction. And that was actually um, something that we did at Dark Skies. We started, um, the entire premise of the show was the truth uh, had to be told under the cover of fiction. And so possibly um, the longer answer to your question, I think, is that sometimes it does have to happen. I'm certainly doing it now with the Undeniable Project and some of the other things that I'm working on. We certainly did it with Dark Skies. And, you know, uh, one thing I'd like to put out there is that um, this is probably a whole show that we should probably uh pick one of those dates in the very near future and and do a deep dive on Dark Skies because there's so many things I haven't actually been able to talk to people about. And I know they're very interested in it. So I'd like to, maybe maybe we can turn the 
I remember we had uh, one episode where I interviewed you about in plain sight. Maybe uh, we'll do one where you and I talk dark skies for a while. Man, I just I, one thing you haven't told me there is where can people watch dark oh, skies if they want to watch that's it? A, that's a uh, well, okay. You can't stream it right now. It's not streaming anywhere. It isn't because it's suppressed, I don't think. I think it's because it's in the four by three ratio as opposed to 16.9. And so possibly some streamers would need it, um, you know, rescanned or something. But there is a way to see it. You, There's a beautiful um, DVD set put out for Dark Skies. It's called Dark Skies Colon, the Declassified Series. Remember, though, uh, and you can get it for a good price. Um, I don't make any money from it, so I can I can pitch it. You can get it from Amazon and the usual suspects. Um, just remember one thing. I did a TV series for Dark Skies on NBC in 1996 and 1997. That's the DVD set I'm talking about. In 2013, Harvey Weinstein made a, a movie called Dark Skies. That's Austin. not my movie. I didn't do that. So I'm asking people to go. I know uh, it would have to be Harvey Weinstein, wouldn't it? Um, so anyway, yeah, Dark Skies, the declassified series. You can get it as a DVD set. It's got uh, four hours of documentary on it. It's got Easter eggs on it. And um, I actually think it's a pretty good watch. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I got a letter recently, very similar to the John Lowengard letter in Dark ah. Sky. And I'll just read you a paragraph. I will warn you, the information I can provide, it's dangerous. It's led to countless individuals losing their lives over, something I will not go into detail excessively about. As long as you're prepared to push, as long as you're prepared to not back down, even in the face of threats or cower, withdraw from investigating. I admire your search for the truth as I'm sure many others will have stated to you previously. Once you're comfortable enough to engage, I'll happily work around whatever means you'd like in order to discuss further. You're going to be left in awe at times. Others, I'd expect nothing more than extensive questioning for clarity and understanding. The cover-up is extensive. That is a great tease. Okay. I think we have our next show. On our next show, <laughs> Ross is going to do a deep dive on what that letter said. And you brought up the Lone Guard letter. I'm going to read it, then we're saying goodbye. Uh, this is the letter that went with the Dark Skies pilot. It's from a person named John Lone Guard. It says, Bryce and Brent, the truth must be told. You have been chosen as instruments to achieve this objective. The truth, however, must not be represented as truth. Too many people who are needed in the struggle will die. The cover of fiction must be used to present this truth. Those who fear the light will not want to bring attention to you by allowing your death. This is the only way. Do not be afraid. The fight for humanity demands your courage. John Lowengard. So they're both, I mean, mine's a little hyperbolic. I'll explain that in our next show. Yours uh, strikes, uh, man, I got I to gotta go have a drink and calm down after hearing uh, that one from you. So folks, that's what we're going to do next time. And, and I mean, that's my thought that I wanted to leave people with is yeah. that people like Bryce and I, we are getting people coming forward saying yeah. they want to talk. They, they've yeah. got evidence. They want to reveal it. And they're prepared to testify before the congressional committees if they get that opportunity. And 2023 is the year where that is going to start to happen. Let's say good night, Ross. Good night, all. <laughs> we can handle the truth. People get ready. All righty there. there. And when you were talking about, what was the question Ross asked you, Bryce? Uh, oh, I don't remember. Uh, John Lungard? I, I asked him a no, question. No, before that. Before that. Before that. Uh, I, I, don't I should know. have written it down. There was a couple of little freezes. Yes, I saw I can on, edit on, on me or on Bryce? Yes, no, on, on Bryce. You. Oh, on me? I saw him yeah. on yeah, no. I saw him on Ross. Yeah, I saw I, I saw a freeze on Bryce and um uh, it yeah. looked like either I dropped out Trans Pacific or Bryce had dropped out.